banks don't deserve to exist unless they're adding value and can add something to their customers. We support millions of businesses and millions of customers who every day are making choices that will affect the planet, will affect climate. The more the financial sector was willing to reduce the cost of capital for areas like clean energy, clean transportation, the more ambitious policymakers can become. From PwC's management publication strategy and business, this is Take On Tomorrow, the podcast that brings together experts from around the globe to figure out what business could and should be doing to tackle some of the biggest issues facing the world. I'm Aisha Hazarika, a columnist and former senior political advisor in London. And I'm Lizzie O'Leary, a podcaster and journalist in New York. In this episode, we'll be talking about the role financial services should play in creating a more sustainable economy, both what's happening now and what to expect in the future. We'll be speaking to Alison Rose, whose voice we heard at the start. Alison is the CEO of NatWest Group, one of the biggest lenders in the UK. She'll tell us how NatWest is tackling these difficult issues through its approach to net zero in its own operations and in the way it decides which businesses to lend money to. She'll also give us her thoughts on how businesses can manage the transition and make the shift as fair as possible. Alison's been with NatWest since 1992, when she started out as a graduate trainee. Her experience gives her a unique perspective on the bank's transition to cleaner capital. But before we hear Alison's story, we're joined by Andrew McDowell, a partner with PwC Luxembourg. He's an economist supporting Strategy and PwC's global strategy consulting business. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you, Aisha. Andrew, we are talking today about the role of financial services in funding the net zero transition. First off, can you explain what net zero is and why it's important? Net zero means cutting greenhouse gas emissions to as close to zero as is possible. The reason why it's so important is because the science is telling us that if we're to avoid cataclysmic climate change, we need to limit the rise in temperatures to no more than 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Now, already we are at about 1.1 degree on average above pre-industrial levels. In order to contain the growth in temperatures to 1.5 degrees, we need to reduce emissions to net zero by 2050 and along the way by about 45% by 2030. Andrew, I can see why it really matters to a society. But is it really an important question for the financial services industry? Yes, uh, it, it definitely is. I mean, the transition to net zero is one of the biggest challenges humankind has ever faced. And it, it's going to involve, if we are to do it successfully, a complete transformation of how we live, how we produce, how we consume, how we move about. And this is highly relevant for the financial services sector resources will need to be mobilized for the massive amount of investment required to deliver net zero, to deliver the massive investment in renewable energy, in clean energy, in clean transportation, in energy efficiency, and in changing technologies underpinning most of what we do today. Most of the physical capital stock in our economy, our buildings, our road, our transport, our factories are going to have to be replaced or at the very least adapted to deliver uh, the net zero challenge. That's going to involve investments by some estimates of about $125 trillion between now and 2050. And I wonder if you could explain what GFANS is and why it's important. Yeah, so GFANS stands for the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. It was launched in the lead-in to the the meeting in Glasgow, the annual meeting of the UN on climate change. And it's essentially a large coalition of leading financial institutions that are committed to accelerating the decarbonisation of the economy. And membership of GFANS basically requires firms, including banks, to commit to net zero using what are called science-based targets or science-based guidelines. And then GFANS as an organization provides its members with guidance and support as to how to adjust their business models and develop credible plans to implement their commitments. Andrew, we're going to come back to you in a moment, but we're going to go back now to Alison Rose, 
Aisha, this is obviously a huge undertaking for NatWest and a huge change in terms of the services that they're providing and who they lend to. Absolutely. Becoming a purpose-led bank doesn't just happen overnight, but they've been putting in a lot of work on this issue. So how can a bank just change its ethos? That's an excellent question, and it's one I put to Alison. The climate challenge or the climate emergency is something which we've all been talking about for a while, but has really come into stark focus, I think, over the last 10 years. When I took over as CEO of the bank just over three years ago, I put the the bank on a new path, which was really about becoming a purpose-led bank. By that, what I mean is, you know, making sure that we're driving real value for all of our stakeholders. So obviously, we need to be a profitable and sustainable bank in terms of delivering value for shareholders. But also, banks don't deserve to exist unless they're adding value and can add something to their customers. Now, the question is, what can a bank do about that? Well, you know, one of the most important things is we can finance the transition. We support millions of businesses and millions of customers who every day are making choices that will affect their planet will affect climate. And as the provider of finance, we can help transition and finance the transition to a low carbon economy. Has the drive, has it come from you personally, or is it a combination of external factors as well and public opinion? But also, is this something that your customers have been asking for and pushing for? So we know it's something our customers care about. We know that institutions are really starting to think about what is the risk of climate change? What is it going to do? So ultimately, it's our job to help them transition. We can get our own house in order as a bank and we're already at net zero. But really, the transition in the economy is going to come from the choices that people and families and businesses are going to be making today and over the next decade. When you made the decision to focus more on the climate emergency. Did you get any internal challenge from shareholders or from other parts of your business? Because there's often this balance, isn't there? The balance between doing the right thing and wanting to do the right thing, but also the pursuit and maximisation of profit and growth. Yeah, and I think what you're talking about there is is really the short-term pressures versus the long-term pressures. You know, I need to deliver a bank that is valuable to shareholders. But, you know, my focus is making sure it's valuable in 10 years' time and 20 years' time and 50 years' time for all of my stakeholders. So it is really balancing all of those elements. And at the early part of this journey, did you have to have some tough conversations with people? Absolutely. We were very clear. Our strategy on climate is threefold. First was get our own house in order. Second, end harmful activity. And then thirdly, transition and help our customers transition. So halve the impact of emissions of our financing. Now, one thing that's really important is the transition. We want to make sure that we're helping customers transition, financing the transition, but also making sure it's a just transition. You know, if we just stopped lending to all oil and gas companies, which, you know, some people advocate we should do, there's not all of the energy available or all of the new technology or or all of the support to transition to a low carbon economy. If we just stop lending to houses that aren't EPC rated A and B, then huge swathes of the country and people and families would not be able to get, you know, mortgages or support for their homes. So, you know, this just transition is really important. But, you know, we had some very clear and tough discussions. We've agreed we're going to phase out lending to coal. It's only 0.1% of my balance sheet lending, so it's small. But we would only work with oil and gas companies that had a credible transition plan aligned with Paris. So that has meant, you know, we have reduced our exposure and we've worked really hard with customers to do that. And when customers come to you to try and get finance for a mortgage or, or maybe for a loan, where does the climate come into that on a practical level? 
Yeah, lots of different ways. So as we think about how can we transition, there's a number of things around putting information into the hands of our customers so that they have the insight and knowledge to make choices. But we also offer things like green mortgages. And then we've also committed £100 billion by 2025 to fund and finance climate transition. So for a lot of our larger customers, access to green bonds, green financing. Collaboration is incredibly important and collaboration between governments internationally is really important as well. You were at the G7 summit in 2021. Tell us about your experience. How did the summit shape your attitude and did it sharpen your sense of urgency? I think that is the first time you've really seen private sector leading the way and coming together to really encourage the governments to act together. We see this as really critical. Private sector has an enormous role to play. But what we need is the policy makers to unlock the policies and collaborate in order to get the money flowing. And I think this is a common goal. I think universally around the G7, it's accepted. You know, there is real commitment um, and real focus of the urgency of getting that done historically, and then going to COP26. There have been previous commitments around making money flow to the developing nations from the developed nations. We really need to live up to those commitments so that globally we can solve it. Because otherwise, if half of the world is still pumping out carbon into the atmosphere, we're all in the same atmosphere. And Alison, when it comes to financing green innovation, what's your view on how a bank like NatWest can help? We have a large entrepreneur accelerator program. We've reserved 25% of spaces in our accelerators, which are completely free for those companies that are developing green and sustainable businesses. And then we bring in partners um, who can help invest in those companies and scale those companies. And it's really interesting in terms of what you're saying about working with some of the venture capitalists. Do you see a new generation of sort of green angels, if you like. I think increasingly when you look at where funds are putting their money, a little bit like my shareholders asking me about what I'm doing on green transition, if you're really talking about long-term value and and long-term sustainable value, there's huge risk in the old economy and huge opportunity in the new economy in terms of a net zero economy. So I I think we see an enormous amount of interest of where people want to put their money for long-term returns. That is one of the things that we need to also be really clear about. If you think about the industrial revolution and, and new economy being developed, this is a new economy that's being developed for the future. In the UK, we did a piece of research last year which talked about banking on a sustainable recovery. We think there is a 160 billion revenue opportunity for small and medium-sized businesses to be part of the transition to a low-carbon economy. Uh, you know, a recent report that came out said there is $265 trillion of funding that will be needed to move to this new net zero economy. Investors who are looking for long-term returns, sustainable return, better risk assets, see the opportunity of financing the new. So that movement of finance, it's not just the banks, it's the asset managers, it's the insurers, it's the global flows of liquidity are looking Mm. to invest in this new economy. Now, we've heard this expression, greenwashing. The ESG report looks really, really good and everything looks very shiny. How can you reassure people that you can be trusted? Yeah, I mean, greenwashing is a very real challenge and a very real impediment to positive progress. So I think what's important is transparency in reporting. Businesses need to be held to account to make sure that they are making those choices, which is one of the commitments we've made is to have clear targets and and clear progress. That's not going to be linear because we're going to go forwards as well as backwards. I think it's being transparent about what we have, making clear what our plans are going forward. I think it's really important that organisations are transparent and we can show it. And 
and not waiting for the perfect data because that will take too long. And making, you know, banks and providers really accountable. For example, our climate transition, my executive team are targeted on that. You know, we've said that's part of our strategy. Uh, we've set clear targets and clear ambitions and we're being very transparent about what we're doing and what we can do and what we can't do, i.e. what's within our control and what isn't. And I think that's how we provide reassurance and comfort to people. Well, Alison, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for giving up some of your time to talk to us here on Take On Tomorrow. Absolute pleasure. Nice to chat to you. Andrew, what are your thoughts on Aisha's interview with Alison? Did anything in particular jump out at you? Yeah, three things in particular jumped out at me. The first is this issue of, of ethos and the importance of making NatWest a purpose-led bank. This is an increasing common theme across a lot of financial institutions, particularly banks. Their customers, their staff, their shareholders and other stakeholders do expect banks to combine financial goals with other non-financial objectives in delivering value to wider society. The second theme was related to that, which is there is a bit of juggling to be done, balancing the short-term needs of shareholders with the needs of other stakeholders. And then the final thing I took from it, I think is extremely important, is the role of government and policymakers in international cooperation. Banks are private institutions, and they are not there to alone solve society's problems. It requires strong leadership and policy direction from governments. And that in turn creates bankable opportunities and financeable opportunities that can deliver returns and support policy goals. But policymakers really do have to set the direction and take the lead if banks are to be able to play their part. Andrew, Alison talked a lot about climate finance. In your experience, is what NatWest are doing becoming mainstream or are they still an outlier? Most banks at this point have already started looking at their carbon footprint and wider environmental footprint of their internal operations that have made various commitments around the use of renewable energy, recycling commitments, and so on and so forth. So that is now pretty common. And increasingly what banks are, you know, as part of GFANS and other initiatives are also now looking at is the impact of their financing. And increasingly, they're looking at that a little bit like NatWest under two dimensions. The first is the kind of positive impact in some ways that their financing decisions can have. And then the second dimension that we see is the the decision about what not to finance anymore. And clearly, NatWest has made a commitment not to finance coal anymore and only to finance oil and gas, where the promoters of those projects have credible transition plans themselves and have published credible transition plans. So this is a, a, an increasing trend that we see across the financial sector. Andrew, Allison talked about the just transition. Is that an issue that financial services organizations need to grapple with? And are they? Um, unlike net zero, which can be kind of easily measured, the concept of the just transition is much more difficult to measure and report against. So I think it's fair to say that financial institutions understand the political importance of the concept, but are, are find it more difficult to operationalize it. Now, what we will, I think, increasingly see is investment opportunities in areas like refitting housing stocks, energy efficiency in housing stocks, refitting and adapting a traditional industry that will allow banks, if they invest in the capabilities and resources needed to understand these technologies, understand these investments, appraise them, price them, to participate very visibly in that just transition. But it does require banks to become able to assess and appraise and understand the risks associated with these investments. It's an opportunity for banks uh, to take advantage of. And following on from that, Andrew, what is the precise role of the private sector in financing this net zero transition? And how can governments and policymakers increase these financial flows towards net zero? There's no doubt the public sector needs to take the lead in defining the ambition, in defining the level of decarbonisation required. 
and to putting in place a kind of predictable policy framework against which the private sector can invest. But equally for policymakers, it's kind of intimidating to set out very ambitious plans unless you know the private sector is there ready to finance it and invest against it at a reasonably low cost of capital. So the more the financial sector, you know, is willing to reduce the cost of capital for areas like clean energy, clean transportation, energy efficiency, the more ambitious policymakers can become because the cheaper it is to make major commitments in terms of decarbonization. So there's a real symbiotic relationship here between, you know, public and private actors. Of course, the other side of this and of climate change is adaptation, building the infrastructure and systems needed to cope with climate change. Is the conversation about that kind of financing at a similar stage to the conversation around net zero? No, it's not yet. An increasing number of countries, particularly developing countries, emerging economies, and countries that are most vulnerable to climate change, are pushing the adaptation agenda very strongly. That is, much attention needs to be paid to the investments needed for these countries to cope with climate change as should be paid to the investments needed to slow climate change. I think the challenge for financial institutions to date has been that climate mitigation projects, such as renewable energy, for example, generate cash flows. They generate cash immediately to service the debt required to finance those investments. Adaptation investments avoid harm in the long run but they don't tend to generate short-term cash flows that are needed to encourage private financing. And I think what we need to see is more cooperation between the public and private sectors to generate bankable opportunities that the, the private financial system can finance. Andrew McDowell, thank you so much for talking with us. My pleasure. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you, Aisha. Lizzie, I thought that was an absolutely fascinating set of conversations with with Alison and then Andrew. I mean, my big takeaway is that this is not really about the question of short-term losses. It is about longer-term gains. I mean, obviously, there is a, a growing feeling from business and society that this is the right thing to do, but there is business opportunity there as well. The other thing I was really struck by what Andrew said is that in order for the private sector to really motor with this, they do need certainty and leadership from policymakers. I think I had similar takeaways, the idea that that sort of external motivator or at least external sort of framework was something that financial institutions could refer back to, could kind of point their shareholders to and say, look, we are doing this in accordance with the following sets of rules and procedures. That was really interesting to me, as well as the idea that some assets, coal being one of them, are are just losing value. And you're right, there is this sort of short-term transition, but the longer-term profitability is important. It, It was so interesting to hear it thought about from a financial services standpoint. Well, Lizzie, I have so enjoyed doing this series. I've so enjoyed, obviously, co-hosting with you, but I feel like I've just learned so much about the world. And as somebody who's very close to politics, I think one of the things that I've really been struck by is actually how bold and how progressive a lot of good smart, successful business leaders are in many ways on things like climate change, the future of work. I've often found some of the conversations we've had with business leaders, with our experts in PwC, more bold and more determined than some of the conversations I'm having with political figures and policy leaders. And I do think the concepts we've talked about, stakeholder capitalism, climate change, What I think this series has really showed is that business is not catching up on these issues. Business is actually at the vanguard of a lot of these issues and really shaping the future and trying to do its bit to to create a better world. One of the questions that we've often asked our interviewees and our guests is, can you afford to do this? And they often come back to us and say, we can't afford not to do this. And I've been really struck by that. We can't afford 
not to have cybersecurity defenses. We can't afford not to upskill our people. We can't afford not to think about how we've got to get to some sort of net zero future. I do think that has been a very compelling argument and one where some of our interviewees have been candid about maybe pushback from shareholders or, or pushback from corporate board executives to say, no, no, this is, this is happening and it's happening now. Take On Tomorrow is brought to you by PwC Strategy and Business. PwC refers to the PwC network and or one or more of its member firms, each of which is a separate legal entity. 